Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to a special edition episode of the DD Geopolitics podcast. I am Sarah Bills, your host, and I am joined by one of my co-hosts all the way from Romania. Stefan, how are you today? Very good. Thank you, Sarah. We are incredibly excited for this conversation this morning with First Deputy Permanent Representative of Russia to the UN, Ambassador Polianski. How are you this morning, sir? Not bad, thank you. We never complain. <laughs> So recently, we, you guys tried to get a resolution pushed through the United Nations Security Council in regards to Yugoslavia. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that re resolution and what it was meant to do? Uh, you know what, Sarah? It's, it was not about resolution, to be quite uh, exact. It was just about uh, discussing this issue. So we wanted to raise this topic and we wanted Security Council to meet and to discuss the repercussions of NATO's aggression against Yugoslavia, which happened uh, 25 years ago. But uh, we all know that the consequences and the fallout of uh, these events uh, uh, are felt uh, even today. And there are a lot of processes in the Balkans and among Serbia and Kosovo uh, that still um, go back to this uh, tragic uh, time when NATO conducted this uh, aggression against an independent state and when NATO forced uh, Serbia uh, to, uh, to, to cede uh, part of its territory against the will of, of Serbia. That's what our desire was. We uh, brought this motion to our colleagues. Uh, initially, the reaction was, uh, I would say, not very positive on behalf of Western countries, but it happens quite a lot when we ask for something and the Western countries are saying that, well, we think it's not worth discussing at this time, or the format is not very good. But all of a sudden, uh, on the 25th of March, when we the meeting was scheduled by the Japanese presidency of uh, Security Council for this month, all of a sudden the French ambassador asked for procedural vote. Procedural vote is quite a rare uh, procedure used in uh, Security Council because mostly uh, the members try to sort out their differences uh, aside from uh, the cameras. But when the uh, contradictions are, not, are unsurmountable, then Security Council uh, votes procedurally. And, and for procedural votes, uh, there is no right of veto. Uh, the one who carries the motion needs to have nine votes in favor. And that's how it works. So. All of a sudden, France called for procedural vote, and not only for procedural vote, um, but also uh, in a very uh, twisted logic, I would say, they did it. Because they were, in fact, questioning our meeting. But what they did, they uh, convinced the president. Uh, they claimed that Russia should bring the motion of uh, having this meeting um, to the colleagues of Security Council. So it's not France who should have... Um, achieved, uh, gained uh, nine votes, but Russia. And this was absolutely another story, of course. Uh, we protested because we think that uh, this is absolutely unfair, to put it this way. Uh, and uh, I, I will spare you from this procedural integrity that uh, we faced uh, during this meeting. But the result was that um, the West, uh, who has, uh, which has a majority uh, in the composition of the current council, the de facto blocked the council from discussing this issue. So French ambassador uh, Nicolas de Rivière claimed that it is a historic issue and it is pure history and Security Council is not entitled to, to discuss this issue. It's a waste of time of the council and all, all these things. So we um, faced this vote. Uh, we lost it uh, during the first um, vote. Uh, we uh, got only three uh, votes in favor. Uh, or everybody else uh, abstained, and it means that we couldn't uh, count on having a meeting. Then wh what we did, uh, we um, asked for a meeting uh, on, a, on a different agenda item, because the French actually questioned the agenda item that we chose. So we chose another agenda item, uh, wrote a letter to the Japanese presidency, and in order to show uh, our frustration and our uh, non-acceptance of what happened, we uh, called uh, proce for procedural vote for every meeting in Security Council during this week, during the last week of Japanese presidency, saying that if Japanese presidency cannot stand for, it, for its words, then we are not sure that we can have this meeting either, and uh, we need to start every 
uh, open meeting of Security Council with a procedural vote. And in every statement uh, on um, this procedural vote, uh, explanation of the votes, we also included something on the 25th uh, anniversary of NATO's aggression against Yugoslavia. So, in fact, um, the, the Western colleagues received the whole week of meetings on Yugoslavia because every morning we started uh, and every afternoon when there was a meeting, we started with reminding uh, about this uh, this event, um, unfortunate event, and at, at the end uh, there was another vote, uh, and this vote uh, went uh, worse for Western colleagues because we have explained our position and now six countries supported us, so it was um, it was six to nine vote, and it clearly showed the division in the council. Uh, the division line was between Western and non-Western council members, and of course. It was quite clear that the West simply wanted to avoid this uh, awkward discussion uh, about an event that they really want to dig uh, dig into the sand of history and uh, never come back to this again. But that's not what we intend to do. We will, of course, um, raise this topic again, and uh, we think it's very important for the Council to discuss it. Well, um, I think it's important as well, especially with the current situation in the Balkans. Um, uh, Ambassador Nabesnia said that some Security Council colleagues would probably say that the events of 25 years ago are history and have no relevance today. However, it is clear to any reasonable mind that the destruction of a sovereign state led to the chaos that is gaining momentum today, and not only in Kosovo, but in the Balkans as a whole. What, how does the situation 25 years ago shed light on the current situation in the Balkans? Like, why is this debate so important now? Why is this discussion so important? Well, first of all, first of all, it has a, a direct impact of international relations. Because we, if we come back to that moment, um, actually, that was uh, the uh, re-emergence of, of the Cold War. Uh, you know that uh, the Cold War was de facto uh, over uh, the beginning of the 90s. And then there were attempts to, to bridge the gaps and to bring uh, Russia and U.S. to cooperate on security agenda, on other important topics. But uh, we, we had some high hopes. I remember this uh, time quite well in Moscow. Everybody was very enthusiastic. Uh, we had, a lot of us had these uh, uh, rosy, rosy glasses, uh, looking at reality through these glasses. And we believe that the West is sincere in accommodating uh, us into the system of international relations. But there was a big disappointment and, and NATO was the core of this disappointment because everybody was expecting that uh, NATO will uh, either seek to exist or it will transform in some kind of, uh, of um, universal uh, security organization or European security organization. Maybe it will merge with OSCE, with Russia on board and with all of us together discussing the principles of uh, indivisible security, when the security is not uh, enforced uh, against the interest of this or that country. That were high hopes and they were all dashed uh, in 1999 when this uh, aggression of NATO began. It, began. it bypassed Security Council, which absolutely makes it uh, illegitimate. They were sure that uh, Russia, China and some other countries will not let it happen. So they decided to bypass uh, Security Council and to show who is um, who is really more important on this planet. Uh, they launched uh, these strikes and it triggered a very harsh reaction from my country, which was still at this moment on the course of uh, having on mending relations with the U.S. and having good economic relations and political relations. We were supporting a lot of U.S. initiatives at this time, but this was a turning point, and I remember. A Russian um, uh, head of government, uh, Evgeny Primakov, uh, was uh, in his plane heading to Washington exactly when the aggression started. So his decision was quite bold, he was already almost approaching the US, and then he said that the plane needs to make a U turn, and he flew back to Russia saying that he can't uh, land in, in, in Washington um, after, after the decision that was taken absolutely against the position of Russia and uh, there was a lot of criticism from his part and from the part of other Russian leaders. So this was an important, important turning point. And it was the first time after, after the, not only after the Cold War, but actually uh, after the uh, adoption of Helsinki Final Act in 1975, when 
the territory of a state uh, was violated uh, by a block or by a country and uh, this was done in absolute breach of international law uh, it was done brazenly and this was a, a, a this created a very very bad precedent that the west of course wants to forget uh, and this wound uh, has not healed uh, until now we feel that uh, regardless of how hard the west pushes um, normalization between serbia and kosovo uh, there is a red line which uh, our serbian friends uh, cannot cross and this is the recognition of, of kosovo independence but kosovo independence so-called kosovo independence um, is rooted in this uh, nato's aggression against yugoslavia this is the only factor who brought it to life and uh, the only explanation uh, why it happened and uh, people in serbia as you know still face a lot of consequences of this aggression uh, environmental medical consequences um, because the, sh the shells with uh, with uh, depleted uranium were used uh, a lot of a lot of people still feel the repercussions on their health. Uh, I was in Belgrade recently. I saw that they preserve the memory of this uh, of this aggression. There are several buildings in, in Belgrade which are not restored specifically to show to to the young generation uh, what happened 25 years ago. So it's not part of history. This is something that that is very very um, actual today. And again. Uh, there is uh, there are a lot of crisis uh, crisis which were triggered by this uh, by this act of NATO and uh, in order to uh, resolve these crises we really need to come back to the root causes what caused it and to try to mend uh, what what was uh, done at this at this point and to restore trust and to restore the right understanding of how to move forward and uh, what to do and what not to do otherwise we will find no solution there can be only only uh, forceful uh, integration of, uh, uh, of 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 kosovo into the european union and serbia may be in the european union but there will be no solution to the uh, issue between uh, between serbia and kosovo go ahead stefan no. Well, uh, first, first of all, Ambassador, as a, as a Serb myself, I thank you and uh, the Russian Federation very much for your continued support for our country and for our uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty, which uh, leads me onto my uh, onto my question of. Uh, so, in your personal opinion, uh, why do you believe that the Western member states of the UN Security Council are just so reluctant to address the NATO bombings themselves, considering that? As permanent members of the the UNSC themselves, they directly violated international law and the UN itself by launching the bombing campaigns without any mandate or permission from the UNSC itself. Well, the answer is very easy because this is uncomfortable for them, and when something is uncomfortable for them, they just pretend that it never happened, and that it has no significance, no importance. For many of them, by the way. The history, uh, the recent history, started uh, only uh, in um, in February 2022. So when we started our special military operation, uh, they were speaking, saying that nothing was preceding this. There were absolutely nothing for us to make to make a reference to. There were no root causes. It was absolutely unprovoked aggression, blah blah blah, all these things. And they, of course, with such a short memory, they don't want to to recall the events of 25 years old. Uh, but they are still in our memory. Uh, I think that even young people, uh, not only those living in, in Serbia, but also elsewhere, they understand uh, what has happened. But maybe they have a little bit uh, twisted, twisted uh, uh, perception of what really happened, because there has been uh, non-stop um, NATO propaganda during all these years, uh, trying to present what NATO did as a good outcome, and uh, that NATO is a savior and that uh, Serbia was not right and that it was a right thing to bomb an independent country right, like, like this and to force uh, this the ceding of its territory in the way it was done. So there were a lot of efforts which are uh, under threat or which can be compromised if Security Council uh, discusses this issue and comes back to the root causes of this situation. And of course, Western countries are not interested in this. And the best tactics uh, for them 
uh, is also well known they they will say that uh, this is not relevant that this is all russia russian propaganda that russia wants to use security council for its uh, for its purposes and to uh, waste the time of security council members we, we know this we we face this situation repeatedly on on other dossiers uh, when, you, when you mentioned how the uh, Western member states of the uh, Security Council, such as the United States, UK, France, etc., uh, on that on that subject, um, in your opinion, why do you believe that the West are so enthusiastic about violating UN Resolution 1244 and the territorial integrity of Serbia with regards to Kosovo, but are then quick to attack Russia, cite themselves citing international law? for incorporating its five new regions into the uh, Russian Federation following the recent uh, referendums in those new in those new regions? Well, I think that's because they have created a concept which is called uh, rules-based international order. And uh, they want to uh, adhere to, to this uh, notion, trying to kind of equalize it with international law, which is not the case. We repeatedly explain the difference because international law is based on the UN Charter with rules-based international order we don't know who, who formulates these rules although we know that United States and its allies formulate the rules and uh, there is no uh, exhaustive list of these rules even and these rules are changed uh, very quickly and very easily if uh, there, there is something that the United States uh, wants or doesn't want to happen or to be discussed uh, that's how they approach, uh, that's the, the optics that they approach uh, every every problem, and this problem is not an exception. I recall the very heated discussion, discussions that happened in 2014, uh, after this illegal coup, which an uh, anti-constitutional coup, which happened in Kiev uh, with a big, big help um, from the West, to put it mildly, and when Crimea decided to be part of, of Russia. Um, to come back to Russia. So you know that there was a referendum. And uh, when we uh, wrote uh, a number of letters to international institutions, including the United Nations, explaining uh, the legal grounds for, uh, for this uh, move uh, by, by residents of Crimea, uh, they were saying, no, no, this is illegal. This is absolutely illegal. This is against international law. And we were saying, okay, Let's imagine, but what about what about Kosovo? They say no, no, Kosovo is totally legal, because this was right and what you did was wrong. So the criteria is very simple, regardless of the fact that, for example, in case of, of Crimea, there was a referendum, and there were international observers at this referendum, and it's very hard to claim that uh, Crimean uh, residents uh, were not eager um, to take this decision. In case of Kosovo, there was no referendum; there was a decision of the parliament. Even if we look at this part of the story we see that it's uh, totally flawed uh, by the west uh, they are, they just if something is not happening to their liking they just try to ignore it and uh, that's how they act in such situations nothing new yeah. uh, thank you on behalf of um, of, of Serbia as well i thank you very much for your answers dimitri so, Ambassador, the UNSC um, recently passed the resolution for ceasefire in Gaza. Um, shortly after the member states released conflicting statements about whether or not the resolution was binding, um, while Israel obviously chose not to adhere to it, at a White House presser, a journalist asked Matt Miller um, a pretty heated question, but I think we're all wondering the same thing, maybe not so rudely, but drawing parallels from... Uh, the Yugoslavia in the 90s to now, the journalist asked, what the hell is the point, excuse my language, but I quote, what the hell is the point of the UN Security Council anymore? Uh, what, what, how does it function anymore? And what mechanisms can we put in place to save it and that it can use to enforce its resolutions? Well, I think that uh, saying that there was a divergence of opinion is an, over, is an overstatement because there was only one opinion uh, which didn't fit uh, with the opinion of other uh, 14 members and not surprisingly it's the opinion of the United States. We were very much uh, astonished uh, to hear the our colleague, uh, permanent representative of the US, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield, uh, saying in her statement uh, after in the explanation of the votes, saying that this is a non-binding resolution. This was really very very bad signal it was first and foremost of course um, for the internal audience for the u.s audience and for israel because 
they made a lot of efforts after that uh, to try to explain to Israel that nothing serious has happened. There is no shift in the U.S. approach. And it's kind of a menu resolution where you can ex implement uh, one thing and you can avoid to implement another thing. This is very bad. We all criticize this move uh, by the U.S. Uh, I think all the colleagues uh, during closed meetings expressed uh, expressed frustration with the way U.S. Uh, is uh, dealing with this resolution. So on the one hand, they took the decision to abstain and to let this resolution, uh, which uh, for the first time demanded for the cessation of hostilities for the ceasefire uh, for the months of Ramadan, uh, leading to a, a, to a lasting sustainable ceasefire. So it's a very good formula if we all implement it. But when one member, especially permanent member, founding father of the UN, is saying that this is a non-binding resolution, of course it gives very wrong signal to Israel, who is actually meant to implement it. And we feel it already now, because the resolution is not being implemented, uh, there is no ceasefire, and it's up to the Council now to decide the next move. Uh, and again, we have the same stumbling block, the same obstacle is the position of the United States. Uh, the position of the United States is very much pro-Israel. The United States is not interested in uh, compromising the efforts of its closest uh, Middle Eastern ally. The United States has shown repeatedly that it will shield um, its uh, ally uh, from any problems in Security Council or elsewhere. But the fact is that with such a position, U.S. is very much isolated in the world. And it, uh, it is isolated in General Assembly where everybody has um, one vote. Uh, the last vote on the Gaza resolution gave the results of 153 in favor of resolution presented by the Arab group. And only a bunch full of countries, uh, I think 10, um, U.S., Israel, and a number of uh, very, very uh, close, I would say, uh, lab dogs of the U.S. Um, supported uh, the motion against this resolution. So that's the reality. And this is a very awkward reality for our American colleagues. Uh, it's very uncomfortable for them to see themselves in such a position. They try to pressure Israel, but it looks like their toolbox for pressure in Israel is quite limited and uh, they do not acknowledge this uh, but it's obvious that for real pressure they need more engagement uh, of all the branches of power which is which is not the case and so coming back to this very uh, weird uh, formula about non-binding resolution so they actually tra trans uh, they actually uh, try to uh, reformulate it and in further statements I saw some comments from the White House uh, they were not as blunt, saying that it's not binding. They already were saying right words that every Security Council resolution needs to be uh, implemented. But uh, at the same time, they cite the right of Israel to defend itself, uh, the, site of Israel, the right of Israel to, to existence, and um, uh, all, all these things. They try to imply that this resolution has a, a twofold approach. Uh, where, whereas in reality it is pointing simultaneously and unconditionally you know, for the necessity of immediate ceasefire and for the necessity of uh, release of hostages. Uh, the U.S. is trying to play in Israel's uh, logic, uh, saying that first hostages, then ceasefire. But this was the logic which was uh, rejected by, the, uh, by all the other members of Security Council at the stage when the resolution was uh, discussed. Uh, so. I don't know where it will bring us, uh, but the U.S. position is becoming more and more awkward uh, in, in this situation. And uh, I feel that they are under very big pressure of the international community and the um, credibility of U.S. and the world uh, is very much at stake in such situation. So, and one last question, Ambassador, um, because of your kind of um, humorous response to the denial of the discussion was that you said from now on, Russia will mention NATO's aggression against Yugoslavia at every session of the UN Security Council. Um, have you already started doing this? And what do you intend to achieve? And also, what lessons can we take from Yugoslavia? We've applied them to Ukraine. What can we apply to well, Gaza? First of all, on what, what we are doing or planning to do. Uh, we, as I mentioned, during the whole week uh, from starting 25th of March, we started every meeting 
uh, when the Japanese uh, presidency was about to adopt the agenda, we claimed for we asked for procedural vote on the agenda in the same way as the Western countries uh, behaved in case of meeting on Yugoslavia. In, in, and in our explanation of the votes, which we have the right to pronounce during such occasions, we uh, brought in some information about NATO's aggression on Yugoslavia. So we made several statements during the whole week. Our main uh, problems were with uh, with Japanese presidency. The Japanese presidency ended uh, with the end of March. Now there is a Maltese presidency. We had a very uh, open discussion with them all together, and they adopted the uh, working methods where they uh, wrote down that they will try to achieve uh, a compromise ahead of uh, each meeting to avoid such situation when uh, a member of the council is not uh, given the opportunity to uh, to raise the topic that uh, he or she wants to raise. So that was uh, kind of a move towards us, and we decided not to obstruct uh, the the work of Security Council procedurally. Uh, starting in April, we'll see how the Maltese presidency will behave in this regard, and uh, we will. Uh, we, the, the question of a meeting is not off the agenda. Uh, there are also procedural implications which we will pursue in our daily work uh, with the colleagues of the Council. And uh, we will coordinate also with the Serbs, with the Serbian mission. Um, we will come back to this, but the fact is that we had two votes and we exhausted, um, we used two agenda items which were rejected by these votes. So it's not um, easy to do it uh, immediately after that. There are a number of uh, other articles that can be used, uh, but we need to weigh carefully uh, when and how to enact them. And uh, so we will come back to this issue for sure. And the second part of your of your question, Sarah, about what are the lessons uh, from Yugoslavia, I would say the lessons that I learned immediately from, from this time when I was still a young a diplomat, uh, several years at diplomatic service, the lesson was very easy never trust the West that's it and uh, we uh, we think that the key to solving uh, the uh, issues that the world faces today very dangerous issues the key to this uh, to these questions also are hidden there in uh, that time when NATO instead of uh, transforming into some kind of uh, pan-european security organization remained uh, as a tool in the hands of the United States and its allies uh, as a tools of uh, NATO countries against everybody else. This was done, of course, in total breach of the uh, understanding and gentleman agreements of the beginning of the 90s to Soviet leaders and Russian leaders about how the uh, our common European house uh, may look like. This was absolutely contradictory to the logic and the mood of, of, of Russia, which was very open and uh, was ready to embrace uh, uh, embrace cooperation with Western countries. We did it in absolutely good faith, but we were rejected. And uh, there were a lot of bad moves that the West uh, was doing against my country at this time. And there are even more, uh, more um, activity of this kind uh, after. So uh, the lesson is right, that right this, this, the current, uh, the current system of international relations where NATO is a pinpoint of of, uh, of uh, European uh, security for NATO members uh, is not sustainable. And we, we need to try uh, to find a solution uh, for the sake of everybody and uh, for the sake of our common European house. Uh, we are ready to do so in Russia. We made uh, very uh, concrete uh, proposals uh, in this regard, on this regard in, at the end of 2021, uh, on the eve of our special military operation. So we did everything in our powers uh, to avoid a uh, forceful scenario, but and unfortunately we were not taken seriously. Uh, so there is still a, a hopefully a big, big diplomatic work ahead and we are ready for such a work, provided the West uh, realizes uh, that uh, they should really um, do, deal with us in good faith and trying to achieve uh, the result that would be beneficiary for everybody and not only for the, for the bunch of countries uh, for the gold, golden billion uh, that uh, is really after only its own interests and doesn't care at all about the interests of the rest of the humanity. So this is the approach that Russia will never support. And 
to a large extent because of what happened uh, to Yugoslavia. There's so many more things that I want to ask, but I know we're out of time. And thank you so much, Ambassador, for fitting us into your incredibly busy schedule. Please follow the Ambassador on Twitter and Telegram. And um, thank you once again, Ambassador. Any closing thoughts for us? Thank you. All the best to you. Thank All the best you. to you. You're doing a good job. I'm following your <laughs> And I see that you have very, very good team and uh, you make very good uh, publications. I think it's, it's very important uh, because nowadays, especially the role of, of mass media is absolutely reversed. I think that people do not trust uh, mass media anymore. And this, this is absolutely the right thing to do, because if you want to get brainwashed, read mass media. If you want to get information, go elsewhere to social media, to Twitter, to Telegram, and uh, read as many sources as you want. There you will get real information, and real analysis, and, and not something that somebody wants you wants you to think. Well, you heard it from the Russian ambassador. If you don't want to be brainwashed, read DD Geopolitics. Thank you all. And this has been another stream. Join us on Friday when we host Haz al Din back from his trip to Moscow. Okay. All the best to you guys. Thank you, Master.